This video is an introduction to the bad science around puberty suppression. In the next 20 minutes, you will learn how researchers and scientific journals have misrepresented the evidence on puberty suppressing drugs and how to find and understand the credible science that's out there. Let's talk about scientific studies, how we evaluate them, and why so many of the so-called puberty blocker studies are yielding such unrealistically positive results. This video will focus on clinical studies, which are the kind of study where they give participants a drug and collect data about the drug's effects, and retrospective studies, where they pull the medical records of people who have already received a certain drug. So the two red flags that most people will be familiar with are small sample size and lack of a control group. If you're not familiar, sample size means how many people participated in the study. The smaller the sample size, the more likely it is that the study's results can be chalked up to a coincidence. Larger sample size is more reliable. And if a study has a control group, that means that some participants were given the drug and some weren't, and the results of the two groups were compared. If a study doesn't have a control group, there's no way of telling whether the results are just the effects of time, natural healing, or other factors, or whether they're actually due to the drug. When evaluating studies, we also look at something called loss to follow up. Clinical studies will collect data at several points throughout the study, and people might drop out between data collection points. A few people dropping out is normal, but if more than 15% of the participants have dropped out by the end of the study, the data start to become unreliable. A lot of recent studies on puberty suppression have problems in all three of these areas. They tend to study just a handful of kids. They tend not to have a control group. And there are studies with 20 or 30 or 40% loss to follow up, which is huge. This is from one of the worst offenders we've seen in this area, Akil et al. 2020. This study lost a whopping 47% of its participants to follow up. And you can see that the researchers are trying to cover this up by acting like only the participants who completed all three waves of questionnaires matter. They actually didn't even report the initial data from the participants who didn't complete the third wave, which is not just massive loss to follow up, it's really shady practice. Another issue we run into with these studies is poor exclusion criteria. Exclusion criteria define who does and doesn't get to participate in a study. For example, if you want to do a clinical study of a drug, you might exclude people who are known to be allergic to that drug. That's a reasonable criterion, because including those people would both endanger your study subjects and unfairly skew the data. Here's an example of an unreasonable exclusion criteria. Johanna Olson Kennedy's 2019 study of kids with so-called gender dysphoria excludes kids who have serious psychiatric symptoms or who appear visibly distraught. So if we're supposed to believe that gender dysphoria is a serious psychiatric illness that causes great distress, then everyone with that illness should be excluded from the study, and the study shouldn't exist. This should go without saying, but political language in a scientific study is also a huge red flag. Most scientific studies end by suggesting directions for future research. They really don't comment on politics or specific legislation. But a lot of studies on puberty suppression do just that. Here's the worst offender we've seen so far. Quote, beyond the need to address anti-transgender legislation, there is an additional need for medical systems and insurance providers to decrease barriers and expand access to gender-affirming care. This paper was published this year in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So you can see just what level of political bias some of these medical journals are sliding into. We should also note that this study, Turdoff et al. 2022, lost 37.5% of its participants to follow up and got published anyway. Another big red flag is when you're reading a study and the conclusion doesn't quite seem to match up with the evidence, or when evidence from within the study is ignored in the conclusion. For example, this is from a paper on the cognitive effects of puberty suppression on girls. The paper shows a difference of eight IQ points between the girls who were puberty suppressed and those who weren't, and concludes that this difference is not significant. Now you can argue that the difference of eight points is not technically statistically significant because it falls within one standard deviation of the mean, but it's weird that the researchers don't seem interested in talking about the difference at all. And actually, if you look further into the study, you'll find that they excluded additional girls from the final data set because their IQ test results were so low and that the actual difference between the two groups was about 25 points, which is really significant. You'll find similar issues in studies like Staphorzius et al. 2015, 
where the evidence suggests that puberty suppression lowered children's scores on a cognitive test, but the conclusion claims that puberty suppression had no effect on test scores. And in the Tavistock's 2015 report, where data clearly shows that children who were puberty suppressed reported more suicidal thoughts and behaviors, but the conclusion flat out ignores this. The bottom line is, if you read a conclusion that seems wonky, don't just accept it. Have a look at the raw data. The last point we'll cover in this section is the issue of voluntary response surveys and survey bias. A voluntary response survey is a kind of less reliable scientific study where participants volunteer to answer questions about a certain topic. Voluntary response surveys are subjective, meaning that participants' feelings can influence their responses, and participants can even lie. They're also vulnerable to bias in two different ways. One, they might be advertised in a way that discourages certain people from participating. And two, the questions on the survey might be worded in a way that encourages one response over another. We see voluntary response surveys used in two 2020 studies spearheaded by Jack Turbin. Both of these studies use data from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, which Turbin calls, quote, the largest cross-sectional survey to date of the transgender adults living in the United States. It's true that the USTS had a large number of participants, over 20,000. But just because it has a large sample size doesn't make it a good survey. For one thing, the U.S. Transgender Survey's website is so obviously politically biased that it would be nearly impossible to imagine a conservative or a detransitioner taking the survey. This image here is from the USTS website. The website makes it clear that the survey is for people who currently consider themselves, quote, trans, who believe in, quote, non-binary trans identities, and who want to, quote, ensure that trans voices will shape the future. If you disagree with any of that, or even with the wording of any of that, it's not a very welcoming website. The survey questions themselves are also pretty biased, meaning they're pretty hard to answer if you disagree with the survey's ideological trappings. Let's look at the survey's two questions on detransition. Question 1220. Have you ever detransitioned? Have you ever gone back to living as your assigned sex at birth? So what do you say to this if you no longer believe in living as a sex? or if you don't believe in the concept of sex assignment, or if you believe that it's actually impossible to transition because it's impossible to change sex, which answer do you choose? The follow-up question is, why did you detransition? And you can see that most of the options given here are about outside pressure, as if the survey assumes that this is the main reason for detransition. One answer, it was just too hard for me, is so vague it could mean anything. And the survey doesn't give you the option to say that the procedures sold as transition hurt your health, or to say that you no longer believe in so-called transition, or to say that you became comfortable with your sex. It does give you the option to write in your own answer, but they don't necessarily count or categorize writing answers. So that's what we mean when we talk about survey bias. With all this bad science going around, it's really easy to just assume that reliable scientific information on puberty suppression and other aspects of so-called transition just doesn't exist. And this is something we've heard time and time again, even from people who oppose these medical abuses. The research just isn't there yet. This is a misconception. Really good research, really well-designed studies on these drugs do exist. They're just being swept under the rug. Let's talk about what that research says and how we can access it. Existing research shows that the drugs marketed as puberty blockers are linked to the following. Loss of bone mineral density and lowered peak BMD, increased risk of fractures and osteoporosis, periodontal disease, increased risk of heart attack, heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, weight gain and increased percentage body fat, impaired thyroid function, hot flashes and migraines, lowered intelligence and IQ, impaired working memory, attention, and executive function, increased risk of dementia, intracranial hypertension, depression, anxiety, and insomnia, and increased risk of suicide, potentially irreversible infertility, polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS, increased risk of autoimmune disease, and more. There is a truly massive body of research that supports all of the above as side effects of these drugs, 
Lesbians United recently released a free booklet with the details on all of this, with over 300 sources cited, titled Puberty Suppression, Medicine, or Malpractice. It's way too much information to cover in this video, but you can read the full report for free on our website. Right now, let's talk about how we can find all these scientific studies and verify all this information, and why we really don't need to be calling for more research to be conducted on minors. The main issue here is something that Lesbians United has talked about before, many times. It's language. Specifically, the anti-lesbian movement coining language that intentionally confuses the issue. The term puberty blockers has been coined to talk about the effects of these drugs on adolescents, and it's been used primarily in a positive context by anti-lesbian activists. So if you search for puberty blockers on Google or on PubMed, you're going to find all of these positive takes and you're going to find all of the badly designed scientific studies that we just covered, which tend to conclude that puberty blockers are totally safe and reversible. But if you use more accurate search terms, you actually get a very different story. The most accurate name for these drugs is gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists, or analogs, which is shortened as GnRH agonists, GnRH analogs, GnRHA, and LHRH agonists. LHRH and GnRH are actually two different names for the same hormone. If you're looking for a specific GnRH agonist or a specific brand name, you can make that your search term. Luprolide, Bucerellin, and Gosserellin seem to be the most common drug names. If you search those terms, and especially if you search them in conjunction with specific areas or side effects, like GnRH agonists and depression, you're going to find older, better designed scientific studies. These studies are usually of adults because the drugs that are now called puberty blockers were actually developed for adults, specifically for adult men with prostate cancer. There are a lot of fantastic studies on GnRH agonists and adults, including retrospective studies with sample sizes over 100,000 and randomized double-blind placebo control studies, which are considered the gold standard for clinical studies. So if your search returns studies of adult men with prostate cancer, you're probably on the right track. Now that we know the terminology, let's finish up by talking about what the drugs actually are, what they actually do, and why they've been linked to such major side effects on so many different parts of the body. GnRH agonists are drugs that replicate gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, which is a naturally occurring hormone in the body. The body's natural GnRH is produced in the hypothalamus, a part of the brain and it travels to the pituitary gland, where GnRH receptors pick it up. GnRH is naturally produced in pulses, and when it's picked up, it tells the pituitary gland to produce something called luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone, in turn, tells the gonads to produce sex hormones, meaning estrogen and testosterone. There's a cascade of hormones involved here. GnRH triggers the production of luteinizing hormone, which triggers the production of the sex hormones. GnRH agonists, the drugs sold as puberty blockers, are actually artificial GnRH. Like natural GnRH, the artificial stuff is picked up by the pituitary gland. But unlike natural GnRH, GnRH agonists work continuously, not in pulses. When the pituitary gland gets a continuous stream of artificial GnRH from these drugs, its GnRH receptors get overloaded, it can't function properly, and it just stops processing GnRH which means that it stops producing luteinizing hormone, which means that the gonads don't get the message to produce estrogen and testosterone, which means that the body is deprived of estrogen and testosterone. Estrogen and testosterone are extremely important hormones that affect the whole body. They regulate brain function, bone density, DNA repair, immune system function, heart health, reproduction, and more. For example, research has shown that there are estrogen and testosterone receptors on cardiomyocytes, which are cells that control the heartbeat. So common sense dictates that we shouldn't tamper with estrogen and testosterone unless it's absolutely necessary. To make things more complicated, we've learned in recent years that GnRH doesn't just affect the pituitary gland, but there are actually GnRH receptors on other areas of the brain as well. Exactly how GnRH operates in those areas is not clear, but again, common sense dictates that messing with the body's natural GnRH levels might have some effects on the brain, 
And again, this is backed up by well-designed studies that show that GnRH agonists affect memory, cognition, intelligence, and mental health. You can see how doctors might consider GnRH agonists to be a reasonable risk when trying to save the lives of prostate cancer patients. But giving these drugs to physically healthy children is a different story. If you take just one thing away from this video, it should be that we as a movement need to stop saying that the science just isn't in yet, that doctors need to be cautious with puberty suppression until more research is conducted. It's true that there are a lot of unanswered questions about the exact mechanisms of how GnRH agonists work in the body. But we already know that GnRH agonists are unsafe, that they have a multitude of serious side effects, and that a number of these side effects are irreversible. We already know, for instance, that GnRH agonists are linked to an increased risk of suicide and to other mental health problems that also increased suicide risk. We know that GnRH agonists decrease bone mineral density and impair bone growth, and that this increases a person's lifetime risk of osteoporosis. We know that they've been linked to cognitive deficits and to stunted sexual and reproductive development. This is not a call for caution. It's a call for the absolute cessation of these drugs being prescribed to minors, period, and for no more experiments to be conducted on minors in this area. Again, you can find Lesbians United's full review of the evidence on GnRH agonists on our website at lesbians-united.org. Thank you for watching this video.